Welcome. Let's look at the thoracic cage. The thoracic cage is a bony and cartilaginous structure that surrounds the thoracic cavity. So this is the thoracic cavity up here within the thoracic region. And the space is enclosed or housed by a bony and cartilaginous structure that is called the thoracic cage. It means that this cage is made up of a bony component and a cartilaginous component. This would unfold as we go with this lecture. So we have the thoracic cavity up here enclosed by the thoracic cage and inferiorly we have the abdominal cavity. The abdominal cavity and the thoracic cavity are not continuous. There is a demarcation that tends to separate these two cavities so that the structures that are enclosed within each of the cavities are held in place. The organs contained within the thorax will be held in place and be prevented from falling down into the abdominal space. So we have diaphragm, which helps to compartmentalize the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity so that these two cavities are separated and structures within them are held in place. So this is the diaphragm that helps to demarcate the thoracic cavity up here and the abdominal cavity down this region. So let's look at the functions of this thoracic cage. So the thoracic cage, we said that it helps to house the thoracic cavity. And of course, within the thoracic cavity, we have vital organs that are located within it. So we can not say that the function of the thoracic cage is to help house these vital structures. And this includes the heart, the lungs, the esophagus, and also the hiatus. Just so going further, we say that thoracic cage aid respiratory process. And it does this because remember when we started this lecture, we said that the thoracic cage is made up of a bony component and a cartilaginous component. This cartilaginous component of the thoracic cage enhances its ability to expand and also to relax. So as it does this, it helps to increase the capacity of the thoracic cavity and also reduces it depending on the situation at hand, depending on whether it is inspiration or expiration. So in this way, we say that the thoracic cage aids respiratory process because of its cartilaginous component, which allows it to expand and also to contract. Also going further, muscles also find their way to attach onto the thoracic cage. They also help to bear the weight of the upper region of the body. So the thoracic cage help to carry the weight of the head and also the neck region. Because the head and the neck are located superior to it, so they help to absorb or carry the weight of this region. So let's look at the structural component of the thoracic cage. A typical human thoracic cage is made up of the ribs, and the ribs are 12 pairs, which means that they are in totality, they are 24. So we have 12 on the right and 12 on the left. And this is where you have the ribs. Then the second structural component is the thoracic vertebra. The thoracic vertebra are also 12 in number. You see the thoracic vertebra in the posterior region. And this is the thoracic vertebra highlighted in red. You see it at the back of the thoracic cage. Then also anteriorly, we have the sternum that's also called the breastbone. And this is the sternum. The sternum is located anteriorly, while we have the thoracic vertebra located posteriorly. So you have the ribs spanning between the, the thoracic vertebra posteriorly to the sternum anteriorly. Although it is not all the ribs that form a structural connection with the sternum. This would see as we go further with this lecture. But just for us to know that we have the sternum in the anterior region and we have the thoracic vertebra in the posterior region. Then you now have the ribs spanning from the thoracic vertebra in the posterior region down to the anterior region where we have the sternum. And that is how they run. Then the next structure is the costal cartilage. The costal cartilages are seen at the anterior end of the ribs, and this is where the costal cartilages are located. So the ribs do not form a connection with the sternum in the anterior region. The ribs is replaced by the costal cartilage in the anterior region, and it is the costal cartilage that now forms a connection with the sternum. This we will also see as we go through with this lecture. So we we'll take each of these structures one after the other to see what they are structurally made up of and also where they are located within the thoracic cage. So let's look at the ribs. We already said at 24 in number, which means we have 12 pairs. We have 12 on the right and 12 on the left. And this is where the ribs are located. We said they span from the thoracic vertebra that is located in the posterior part to the anterior region where we have the sternum. 
Also a bit detail on the ribs. The ribs are classified into three. We have the true ribs and these are the true ribs. They are called the true ribs because they form a connection with the thoracic vertebra posteriorly and the sternum anteriorly. So these are called the true ribs and they are from rib one to seven. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So from this region up to this region, we have the true ribs because these ribs form a direct connection with the sternum anteriorly and also the thoracic vertebra posteriorly. Then the next group of ribs that we have are the first rib. And these are the first rib, rib eight to rib 10. They are first rib because they have a connection with the thoracic vertebra posteriorly and spanning through to the anterior region. They have an indirect connection with the sternum. What do I mean by indirect? If you look at the true ribs, you see that they are directly connected to the sternum. But if you look at the first rib, they are connected to the costal cartilages that are located above them. So they do not have a direct connection with the sternum, but the kind of connection that they create with the sternum is an indirect connection. So you see them from this region, eight, nine, and 10. They are connected to the costal cartilages that are located superior to them. So they are not directly connected to the sternum as we see in the true ribs. And that is why they are called the first rib. And the next set of ribs are the floating ribs. Just from the name, you already should know what they mean. Floating ribs, of course, they connect to the thoracic vertebra posteriorly. And you see them spanning through but are lost along their path, they do not form any structural connection, whether directly or indirectly to the sternum. So you see them, they are floating within this space and that is why they are called the floating ribs. And you have the 11th and the 12th ribs classified as the floating ribs. So you have the true ribs, you have the first ribs and you have the floating ribs. And these ribs are so classified based on the connection that they have with the sternum, whether directly or indirectly or not even structurally connected to the sternum. So going further, we have the thoracic vertebra. The thoracic vertebra, they are 12 in number, and these are pieces that are arranged one on top of each other. And where you see them in the region of the thoracic cages in the posterior region, and that is the region where the ribs emerges from. So we have 12 of them. We have the first to the 12th thoracic vertebra. And there are small pieces of bones, as we have said, that are arranged one on top of each other. And that is how they tend to form the elongation that is seen in the posterior part of the thoracic cage. And this is the thoracic vertebra. Then going further, we have the sternum. The sternum is also referred to as the breastbone. And you see this as an elongated bone that is seen in the anterior part of the thoracic cage. And this is the sternum. Going a bit more on the sternum, the sternum is subdivided into three subregions. So if you create a demarcation between this space, we have the manubrum. The superior part of the sternum is called the manubrum. And inferior to the manubrum, we have the body of the sternum. Also inferior to the body, if you create a demarcation at the distal end of the body, you have the sinusoid process. So we have these three regions. Also for us to have that, we have the sternal angle of Louis. This also corresponds to the level of the T4, T5 thoracic vertebra. And this angle is created between the manubrum and the body of the sternum. So it is created between this region, the line that separates the manubrum, which is the superior part of the sternum and the body. And this is the sternal angle of Louis or the manubrosternal joint, which is the joint that connects the manubrum of the sternum with the body of the sternum. So at this joint, it's of great clinical importance because we have a number of clinical events that occur at this region, such as the arc of aortan, the bifurcation of the trachea. It also corresponds to the level of the second costal cartilage and also the second rib. This is our first rib and this is the second rib. So this T45 thoracic level also correspond to the second costal cartilage and also the second rib. So we have a number of events we can go and add to the list that occur around this region. 
Then going further, we have the coastal cartilages. Remember we said that the coastal cartilages are seen in the anterior part of the thoracic cage. These cartilages replace the rib in the anterior part of the thoracic cage. And these are highlighted in red, and these are the coastal cartilages. The ribs, we said they extend from the posterior parts, and that is from the thoracic vertebra, and they span through to be connected to the sternum anteriorly, but they do not have a direct connection to the sternum. They are replaced by the coastal cartilages, which are lighted or painted in red. And it is these coastal cartilages that finally connect to the sternum. And this is what the coastal cartilage does. And we've already said that they allow for the expansion and also the contraction of the thoracic cage, which helps to aid respiratory processes. Also, let's look at the boundaries. Superior boundary of the thoracic cage is called the superior thoracic aperture, or it's also referred to as the thoracic inlet, which is a means through which structures from the head and the neck region will pass through to enter into the thorax. And this is the boundary. And this boundary is created by the body of the thoracic vertebra posteriorly, they have the medial border of the first rib, the associated coastal cartilages. But the specific region of the ribs that is seen as the boundary of the superior thoracic aperture is the medial border of the ribs and also the medial border of the coastal cartilages because the lateral border is on the outside while we have the medial border on the inside. So it is the medial border of the coastal cartilages and also the medial border of the first rib that form the boundary of the superior thoracic aperture. Then we have the superior border of the manubrium, which is the superior part of the sternum. Then posteriorly, we have the body of the first thoracic vertebra. So we have those structures forming this alignment that is called the superior thoracic aperture, which is seen at the upper part of the thoracic cage or the entrance of the thoracic cage. So in summary, from posterior to anterior, we have the body of the first thoracic vertebra. We have the medial border of the first rib, the medial border of the first costal cartilage. Then we have the superior border of the manubrum. And those are the structures that form the boundary of the superior thoracic aperture or the thoracic inlet. Then going to the inferior region, we have the inferior thoracic aperture or the thoracic outlet. This is where structures in the thoracic cavity will pass through to enter into the abdominal space. We already know that we have a number of structures like the esophagus, the iota, that need to run through from the thorax to enter into the abdomen to and fro, depending on what they are carrying or where they are carrying it to, they will definitely need to pass through this aperture before they can enter the inferior region of the body, which this region is the abdomen. So we have the inferior thoracic aperture. So what are the boundaries of this inferior thoracic aperture? And this is the outline of the inferior thoracic aperture, the thoracic outlet. So the first structure is the Seinfeld process. The Seinfeld process is a finger-like extension from the body of the sternum. And you see it in the inferior margin. And this tends to form the anterior border of the inferior thoracic aperture. So it is seen in the anterior part. So if you go more laterally, you have the coastal margin. These are the margins that are formed by the coastal cartilages. And this is how they run from this region down. Also in the other region, they also run down. Then the next structure you have Going more posteriorly is the tip of the 11th rib. Remember, we classified the 11th rib as one of the floating ribs that are being suspended within this space. They do not have a structural connection to the sternum. So the tip of the 11th rib and also the 12th rib itself. Then going more posteriorly, then you now have the body of the 12th thoracic vertebra at the back. Now that is how they run within the heart line forming the inferior thoracic aperture or the thoracic outlet. So these structures as listed, the Seinfeld process, the coastal margin, the tip of the 11th rib, and also the 12th rib. Then finally, we have the body of the 12th thoracic vertebra. So these structures form the boundaries of the inferior thoracic aperture or the thoracic outlets. Also to add that the inferior thoracic aperture is not left open because if it is, structures in the thoracic space would be able to descend down into the abdomen and this we do not want. So it is closed up. This space is padded up or closed up by the structure that is called the diaphragm. So we have the diaphragm closing up the inferior thoracic aperture so that structures are not just seen 
moving down into the abdominal space. Also within the diaphragm, we have three apertures created, which are O's created on the diaphragm to allow vital or important structures that needs to run to and fro the thorax and the abdomen to pass through. So we have the caval opening, we have the esophageal opening, and we have the aortic opening. The caval opening is to allow the passage of the inferior vena cava. The inferior vena cava will pass through this opening and enter into the thoracic cavity because it collects the venous drainage from the inferior part of the body. And you see it merging with the superior vena cava, which now becomes the vena cava. The vena cava then drains venous blood into the heart. Then we have the second opening that is the esophageal opening. Remember the esophagus, we have the cervical region, we have the thoracic region, and we have a very short abdominal region of the esophagus. So the esophagus, we also need to run through from the thorax to enter into the abdomen before they find become expanded to become the stomach. They also need to pass through the esophageal hiatus. Then we have the aortic hiatus, which allow the passage of the iota, which is the largest artery in the body. This iota is a continuation of the arc of aorta, which becomes the thoracic aorta, which is the initial segment of the descending aorta. From the thoracic aorta, it becomes the abdominal aorta. For it to become the abdominal aorta, it needs to be seen within the abdominal space. And of course, it will need to pass through the aortic hiatus. And that is why you have this O created to allow for its passage, for it to now become the abdominal aorta. So there are important structures that need to pass through to and fro the thorax and also the abdomen. And this O are so created to allow for this passage. So let's look at this class drill. Arrows will be pointing to different regions of the thoracic cage and will be expected to highlight the names of these structures. So look at this, where the arrow is pointing to. This is a region of the sternum, and we have subdivided the sternum into three sub-regions. So going through this lecture, you should be able to identify what specific region of the sternum that the arrow pointing yellow is. Also, we have the distal region of the sternum. Then we have this structure. Then we have the structure highlighted in red. Then we have the posterior region of the thoracic cage. Then we have another region, which is one of the ribs, but you need to specifically classify what type of ribs this is. So thanks for watching. Let's meet again.